Hello and good evening, folks. I'm Mr. Medina, and let's get back to Greek mythology at the Enclave. Okay, here we have our book of Greek myths, and today I want to start off with our next Greek myth about Persephone. Now, Persephone was the wife of Hades. And Persephone grew up on Olympus and her gay laughter rang through the brilliant halls. She was the daughter of Demeter, a goddess of harvest, and her mother loved her so dearly she could not bear to have her out of her sight. When Demeter sat on her golden throne, her daughter was always on her lap. When she went down to earth to look after her trees and fields, she took Persephone. Wherever Persephone danced on her light feet, flowers sprang up. She was so lovely and full of grace that even Hades, who saw so little, noticed her and fell in love with her. He wanted her for his queen, but he knew that her mother would never consent to part with her, so he decided to carry her off. One day, as Persephone ran into the meadow gathering flowers, she strayed away from her mother and the attending nymphs. Suddenly, the ground split open, and up from the yawning crevice came a dark chariot, drawn by a black horse. At the reins stood grim Hades. He seized the terrified girl, turned his horses, and plunged back into the ground. A herd of pigs rooting in the meadow tumbled into the cleft, and Persephone's cried, and no help had come. It had died out as the ground closed again, and as suddenly as it had opened. But in the field, the little swineherd stood and wept over the pigs he had lost. While the meter rushed wildly into the meadow, looking in vain for her daughter, who had vanished without leaving a trace. With the frightened girl in his, uh, in his arms, Hades raced his snorting horses down away from the sunlit world. Down and down they sped on the dark path to his dismal underground palace. So we see here Demeter and Persephone laughing and enjoying themselves in the flowers. Then we have Hades and his dark chariot stealing Persephone from the world above. And look, the swine herder lost some, some pigs and was very distraught. Let us continue with Persephone's tale. He led weeping Persephone in seated her beside him on the throne of black marble and decked her with gold and precious stones. But the jewels brought her no joy. She wanted no cold stone. She longed for the warm sunshine and flowers and her golden tressed mother. Dead souls crowded out from the cracks and crevices to look at their new queen, while ever more souls came across the sticks and Persephone. Watch them drink from the spring under dark poplars. It was the spring of Leith, and those who drank from the waters forgot who they were and what they had done on earth. Rodamathus, a judge of the dead, dealt out punishments to the souls of great sinners. They were sentenced to suffer forever under the whips of avenging Aaronize. Heroes were led to the Elysian fields where they lived happily forever in never failing light. Around the palace of Hades there was a garden where whispering poplars and weeping willows grew. They had no flowers and bore no fruit and no birds sang in their branches. There was only one tree in the whole realm of Hades that bore fruit. That was a little pomegranate tree. The gardener of the underworld offered tempting pomegranates to the queen but per Persephone refused to touch the food of the dead. Wordlessly, she walked through the garden of silent Hades' side, and slowly her head, heart turned to ice. 
Above the on earth, the meter ran about searching for her lost daughter, and all nature grieved with her. Flowers wilted, trees lost their leaves. <coughs> the fields grew barren and cold <coughs> in vain. Did the plow cut through the icy ground? Nothing could sprout and nothing could grow while the goddess of harvest wept. People and animals starved, and the gods begged Demeter again to bless the earth. <coughs> Excuse me. But she refused to let anything grow until she had found her daughter. Bent with grief, Demeter turned into a gray old woman. She returned to the meadow where Persephone had vanished and asked the sun if he had seen what had happened, but he had said no. Dark clouds had hidden his face that day. She wandered, she wandered around the meadow, and after a while she met a youth whose name was Triptolemus. He told her that his brother, a swineherd, had seen pigs disappear into the ground and had heard the frightened screams of a girl. Demeter now understood that Hades had kidnapped her daughter, and her grief turned to anger. She called to Zeus and said that she would never again make the earth green if he did not command Hades to return. And we see look at the artwork here. Everything's barren. Nothing would grow without Demeter's blessing. Zeus could not let the world perish, and he sent Hermes down to Hades, bidding them to let Persephone go. Even Hades had to obey the orders of Zeus, and sadly he said farewell, farewell to his queen. Joyfully, Persephone leaped to her feet, but as she was leaving with Hermes, a hooting laugh came from the garden. There stood the gardener of Hades, grinning. He pointed to a pomegranate from which a few of the kernels were missing. Persephone, lost in thought, had eaten the seeds, he said. Then dark Hades smiled. He watched Hermes lead Persephone up to, up to the bright world above. He knew that she must return to him, for she had tasted the food of the dead. When Persephone again appeared on earth, the meter sprang to her feet with a cry of joy and rushed to greet her daughter. No longer was she a sad old woman, but a radiant goddess. Again, she blessed her fields, and the flowers bloomed anew, and the grain ripened. Dear child, she said, never again shall we be parted. Together we shall make all nature bloom. But joy soon was changed to sadness, for Persephone had to admit that she had tasted the food of the dead and must return to Hades. However, Zeus decided that mother and daughter should not be parted forever. He ruled that Persephone had to return to Hades and spend one month in the underworld for each seed she had eaten. Every year when Persephone left her, Demeter grieved, nothing grew, and there was winter on earth. But as soon as her daughters like footsteps were heard the whole earth burst into bloom spring had come as long as mother and daughter were together the earth was warm and bore fruit Demeter was a kind goddess she did not want mankind to starve during the cold months of winter when Persephone was away she lent her chariot laden with grain to Triptolemus the youth had helped her find her lost daughter she told them to scatter her golden grain over the world and teach them how to sow it in spring and reap it in fall and store it away for long months when again the earth was barren and cold. This colorful drawing and artwork is that of Persephone and Demeter reuniting, making the earth bloom. Well, thank you very much. That was the myth of Persephone. Next week, we will talk about the god Dionysus, the wine god, personal favorite of mine. Let us continue with the story of Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief. Where did we leave off? Aha, uh -huh. chapter 10. I ruin a perfectly good bus. So right now, Percy and his 
compatriots Annabeth and Grover have been awarded a quest. A quest to re receive or to get back the lightning bolt. Hence the title of the name, The Lightning Thief. So let us continue and see where this quest takes them. It didn't take me long to pack. I decided to have the Minotaur horn in my cabin, which left me only an extra change of clothes and a toothbrush to pa stuff in my backpack Grover had found for me. The camp store loaned me $100 in mortal money and 20 golden drachmas. These coins were as big as Girl Scout cookies and had images of various Greek gods stamped on one side and the Empire State Building on the other. The ancient mortal drachmas had been silver, Chiron told us, but Olympians never use less than pure gold. Chiron said the coins might come in handy for non-mortal transactions, whatever that meant. He gave Annabeth and me a canteen of nectar and a Ziploc bag full of ambrosia, ambrosia squares to be used only in emergencies if we were seriously hurt. It was God food, Chiron reminded me. It was to cure us of almost any injury, but it was lethal to mortals. Too much of it would make a half-blood very, very, very feverish. An overdose would burn us up, literally. Annabeth was bringing her magic Yankees cap, which she told me had been a 12th birthday present from her mom. She carried a book of famous classical architecture written in ancient Greek to read when she got bored, and a long bronze knife hidden in her shirt sleeve. I was sure the knife would get us busted the first time we went through a metal detector. Grover wore his fake feet and his pants to pass as a human. He wore a green Rasta-style cap because when it rained, his curly hair flattened and you could just see the tips of his horns. His bright orange backpack was full of scrap metal and apples to snack on. In his pocket was a set of reed pipes his daddy goat had carved for him. Even though he only knew two songs, Mozart Piano Concerto Number no. 12 and Hilary Duff's So Yesterday, both of which sounded pretty bad on reed pipes. We waved goodbye to the other campers, took one last look at the strawberry fields, the ocean, and the big house, then hiked up Half Blood Hill to the tall pine tree that used to be Talia, daughter of Zeus. Chiron was waiting for us in his wheelchair. Next to him stood a surfer dude. I'd seen when I was recovering in the sick room. According to Grover, this guy was the camp's head of security. He supposedly had eyes all over his body, so he could never be surprised. Today, though, he was wearing a chauffeur's uniform, so I could only see extra peepers on his hands, feet, face, and neck. This is Argus, Chiron told me. He will drive you into the city and, er, well, keep an eye on things. I heard footsteps behind us. Luke came running up the hill carrying a pair of base basketball shoes. Hey, he panted. Glad I caught you. Annabeth blushed. The way she always did when Luke was around. Just wanted to say good luck, Luke told me. And I thought, um, maybe you could use these. He handed me the sneakers, which looked pretty normal. They smelled kind of... They even smelled kind of normal. Luke said, Maya. White birds... Wings sprouted out of the heels and started startling me so much I dropped them. The shoes flapped around in the ground until the wings folded and disappeared. Awesome, Grover said. Luke smiled. Those served me well when I was on my quest. Gift from Dad, of course. I don't use them much these days. His expression turned sad. I didn't know what to say. It was cool enough that Luke had come to say goodbye. I'd been afraid he might resent me for getting so much attention the last few days. But here, he was giving me a magic gift. It made me blush almost as much as Annabeth. Hey, man, I said, thanks. Listen, Percy, Luke looked uncomfortable. A lot of hopes are riding on you, so just kill some monsters for me, okay? We shook hands. Luke patted Grover's head between his horns, then gave a goodbye hug to Annabeth, who looked like she might pass out. After Luke was gone, I told her, you're hyperventilating. Am not, Annabeth said. You let him capture the flag instead of you, didn't you? Oh, why do I want to go anywhere with you, Percy? She stomped down the other side of the hill where a white SUV waited on the shoulder of the road. Argus followed, jingling his car keys. I picked up the flying shoes and had a sudden bad feeling. I looked at Chiron. I won't be able to use these, will I? 
He shook his head. Luke meant well, Percy, but taking to the air, that would not be wise for you. I nodded, disappointed, but then I got an idea. Hey, Grover, you wanted a magic item? His eyes lit up. Me? Pretty soon, we'd lace the sneakers over his fake feet, and the world's first flying goat boy was ready for launch. Maya, he shouted, and got off the ground okay, but then flew fell over sideways, so his backpack dragged through the grass. The winged shoes kept bucking up and down like tiny broncos. Practice, Chiron called after him. You just need practice. Ah! Grover went flying sideways down the hill like a possessed lawnmower, <laughs> heading toward the van. Before I could follow... Chiron caught my eye, arm. I should have trained you better, Percy, he said. If only I had more time. Hercules, Jason, they all got more training. That's okay. I just wish I stopped myself because I was about to sound like a brat. I was wishing my dad had given me a cool magic item to help on the quest. Something as good as Luke's flying shoes or Annabeth's invisible cap. What am I thinking, Chiron cried. I can't let you go away without this. He pulled a pen from his coat pocket and handed it to me. It was an ordinary disposable ballpoint black ink removable cap. Probably cost 30 cents. Gee, I said, thanks. Percy, that's a gift from your father. I've kept it for years, not knowing you were who I was waiting for. But the prophecy is clear to me now. You are the one. I remember the field trip to the Metropolitan Museum of Art when I vaporized Mrs. Dodds. Chiron had thrown me a pen that turned into a sword. Could this be? I took the cap. I took off the cap and the pen grew longer and heavier in my hand. In half a second I held a shimmering bronze sword with a double edged blade, a leather wrapped grip, and a flat hilt riveted with gold studs. It was the first weapon that actually felt balanced in my hand. The sword had a long and tragic history that we need not go into, Chiron said. Its name is Anaclusmos, Riptide, I translated, surprised. The ancient Greek came so easily. Use it only for emergencies, Chiron said, and only against monsters. No hero should harm mortals unless absolutely necessary. Of course, but this sword wouldn't harm them in any case. I looked at the wickedly sharp blade. What do you mean it wouldn't harm mortals? How could it not? The sword is celestial bronze, forged by the Cyclops, tempered in the heat of Mount Etna, cooled in the river Liv. It's deadly to monsters, to any creature from the underworld, provided they don't kill you first, but the blade will pass through mortals like an illusion. They simply are not important enough for the blade to kill. And I should warn you, as a demigod, you can be killed by either celestial or normal weapons. You are twice as vulnerable. Good to know. Now, recap the pen. I touched the pen, capped to the sword tip, and instantly riptide strength to a ballpoint pen again. I tucked it in my pocket, a little nervous because I was famous for losing pens at school. You can't, Chiron said. Can't what? Lose the pen, he said. It's, it is enchanted. It will always reappear in your pocket. Try it. I was wary, but I threw the pen as far as I could down the hill and watched it disappear in the grass. It might take a few moments, Chiron told me. Now check your pocket. Sure enough, the pen was there. Okay, that's extremely cool, I admitted. I admitted. But what if a mortal sees me pulling out a sword, Chiron smiled. Mist is a powerful thing, Percy. Mist? Yes, read the Iliad. It's full of references to the stuff. Whenever your divine or monstrous elements mix with the mortal world, they generate mist that obscures the vision. Of humans, you will see things just as they are, being a half-blood. But humans will interpret, interpret things quite differently. Remarkable, really, the lengths at which humans will go to fit things into their versions of reality. I put Riptide back in my pocket. For the first time, the quest felt real. I was actually leaving Half-Blood Hill. I was heading west with no adult supervision, no backup plan, not even a cell phone. Chiron said cell phones were traceable by monsters. If we used one, it would be worse than sending up a flare. I had no weapon stronger than a sword to fight off monsters and reach the land of the dead. Chiron, I said, when you say the gods are immortal, I mean, there was a time before them, right? Four ages before them, actually. The time of the Titans was the fourth age, something sometimes called the Golden Age, which is definitely a misnomer. This is the time of the Western civilization and the rule of Zeus in the fifth age is the fifth age. 
So what was it like before the gods? Chiron pursed his lips. Even I'm not old enough to remember that child. But I know it was a time of darkness and savagery for mortals. Kronos, the lord of the titans, called his reign the golden age because men lived innocent and free of all knowledge. But that was mere propaganda. The titan king cared nothing for your kind except that as appetizers or a source of cheap entertainment. It was only in the early reign of Lord Zeus when Prometheus, the good titan, brought fire to mankind that your species began to progress and even Prometheus was branded a radical thinker. Zeus punished him severely, as you may recall, of course. Eventually, the gods warmed to humans, and Western civilization was born. But the gods can't die now, right? I mean, as long as Western civilization is alive, they're alive. So even if I failed, nothing could happen so bad it would mess up everything, right? Chiron gave me a melancholy smile. No one knows how long the age of the West will last, Percy. The gods are immortal, yes, but then so were the Titans. They still exist. Locked away in various prisons, forced to endure endless pain and punishment, reduced in power, but still very much alive. May the fates forbid that the gods should ever suffer such a doom, or that we should ever return to the darkness and chaos of the past. All we can do, child, is follow our destiny. Our destiny, assuming we know what that is. Relax, Chiron told me. Keep a clear head. And remember, you may be about to prevent the biggest war in human history. Relax, I said. I'm very relaxed. When I got to the bottom of the hill, I looked back. Under the pine tree that used to be Talia, daughter of Zeus, Chiron was now standing in full horseman form, holding his bow high in salute, just your typical summer camp send-off by your typical centaur. Argus drove us out of the countryside and into western Long Island. It felt weird to be on the highway again, Annabeth and Grover sitting next to me as if we were normal car poolers. After two weeks at Half-Blood Hill, the real world seemed like fantasy. I found myself staring at every McDonald's, every kid in the back of his parents' car, every billboard and shopping mall. So far, so good, I told Annabeth. Ten miles and not a single monster. She gave me an irritated look. It's bad luck to talk like that way, seaweed brain. Remind me again, why do you hate me so much? I don't hate you. Could have fooled me. She folded her cap of invisibility. Look, we're just not supposed to get along, okay? Our parents are rivals. Why? She sighed. How many reasons do you want? One time my mom caught Poseidon with his girlfriend in Athena's temple, which is hugely disrespectful. Another time Athena and Poseidon competed to be the patron god for the city of Athens. Your dad created some stupid saltwater spring for his gift. My mom created the olive tree. The people saw that her gift was better, and they named the city after her. They must really like olives. Oh, forget it. Now, if she invented pizza, now that I could understand. I said, forget it. In the front seat, Argus smiled. He didn't say anything, but the one blue eye in the back of his neck winked at me. Traffic slowed us down in Queens. By the time we got in Manhattan, it was sunset and starting to rain. Argus dropped us at the Greyhand station on the Upper East Side, not far from my mom and Gabe's apartment. Taped to a mailbox with us was a soggy flyer with my picture on it. Have you seen this boy? I ripped it down before Annabeth and Grover could notice. Argus unloaded our bags, made sure we got our bus tickets, and drove away. The eye on the back of his hand opening to watch us as he pulled out of the parking lot. I thought about how close I was to my old apartment. On a normal day, my mom would be home from the candy store by now. Smelly Gabe would probably was probably up there right now playing poker, not even missing her. Grover sh shouldered his backpack. He gazed down the street in the direction I was looking. You want to know why she married him, Percy? I stared at him. Were you reading my mind or something? Just your emotions, he shrugged. Guess I forgot to tell you satyrs can do that. You were thinking about your mom and your stepdad, right? I nodded. Wondering what else Grover might have forgotten to tell me. Your mom married Gabe for you, Grover told me. You call him smelly, but you've got no idea. The guy has this aura. Yuck. I can smell it from here. I could smell traces of him on you, and you haven't been near him for a week. Thanks, I said. Where's the nearest shower? You should be grateful, Percy. Your stepfather smells so repulsively. Humans, he can mask the presence of any demigod. 
As soon as I took a whiff inside his Camaro, I knew Gabe had been covering your scent for years. If you hadn't lived with him every summer, you probably would have found by found by you would have been found by monsters a long time ago. Your mom stayed with him to protect you. She was a smart lady. She must have loved you a lot to put up with that guy. It that makes you feel any better. It didn't, but I forced myself not to show it. I'll see her again. I thought she isn't gone. I wondered if Grover could still read my emotions mixed up as they were. I was glad he and Annabeth were with me, but I felt guilty that I hadn't been straight with them. I hadn't told them the real reason I said yes to this crazy quest. The truth was I didn't care about retrieving Zeus's lightning bolt or saving the world or even helping my father out of trouble. The more I thought about it, I resented Poseidon for never visiting me, never helping my mom, never sending a lousy child support check. He'd only claim me because he needed a job done. All I cared about was my mom. Hades had taken her unfairly, and Hades was going to give her back. You will be betrayed by the one who calls you friend. The oracle whispered in my mind. You will fail to save what matters most in the end. Shut up, I've told you. The rain kept coming down. We got restless waiting for the bus and decided to place a hacky sack. With one of Grover's apples. Annabeth was unbelievable. She could bounce the apple off her knee, her elbow, her shoulder, whatever. I wasn't too bad myself. The game ended when I tossed the apple toward Grover and it was too close to his mouth. And one mega goat bite or hacky sack disappeared. Core, stem, and all. Grover blushed and he tried to apologize, but Annabeth and I were too busy cracking up. Finally, the bus came. As we stood in line to board, Grover started looking around, sniffing the air like he's he smelled his favorite school cafeteria delicacy, enchiladas. What is it, I asked. I don't know, he said tensely. Maybe it's nothing, but I could tell it, was, it wasn't nothing. I started looking over my shoulder, too. I was relieved when we finally got on board and found seats together in the back of the bus. We stowed our backpacks. Annabeth kept slapping her Yankees cap nervously against her thighs. As the passengers got on, Annabeth clamped her hand on my knee. Percy. An old lady had just boarded the bus. She wore a crumpled velvet dress, lace gloves, and a shapeless orange knit hat that shadowed her face, and she carried a big paisley purse. When she tilted her head back, her black eyes glittered, and my heart skipped a beat. It was Mrs. Dodds, older, more withered, but definitely the same evil face. I scrunched down in my seat. Behind her came two more old ladies, one in a green hat, one in a purple hat. Otherwise, they looked exactly like Mr. Mrs. Dodds. Same gnarled hands, paisley handbags, wrinkled velvet dresses, triplet demon grandmothers. They sat in the row, in the front row, right behind the driver. The two of them on the aisle crossed their legs over the walkway, making an X. It was casual enough, but it sent a clear message. Nobody leaves. The bus pulled out the station, and we headed through the slick streets of Manhattan. She didn't stay long. She didn't stay dead long, I said, trying to keep my voice from quivering. I thought you said they could be dispelled for a lifetime. I said if we're lucky, Annabeth said. You're obviously not. All three of them, Grover whimpered, the immortals. It's, a, it's okay, Annabeth said, obviously thinking hard. The Furies, the three worst monsters from the underworld, no problem. No problem. We'll just slip out the windows. They don't open, Grover moaned. A back exit, she suggested. There wasn't one. Even if there had been one, it wouldn't have helped. By the time we were in Ninth Avenue, headed for London, Lincoln Tunnel, they won't attack us with witnesses around, I said. Well, they mortals don't have good eyes, Annabeth reminded me. Their brains can only process what they see through the mist. They'll see three old ladies killing us, won't they? She thought about it. Hard to say, but we can't count on mortals for help. Maybe an emergency exit in the roof? We hit the Lincoln Tunnel and the bus went dark, except for the running lights down the aisle. It was eerily quiet without the sound of rain. Mrs. Dodds got up in a flat voice as if she rehearsed it. She announced to the whole bus, I need to use the restroom. So do I, the second sister. So do I, said the third sister. Then all started. they all started coming down the aisle. I've got it, Emma said. Percy, take my hat. What? You're the one they want. Turn invisible and go up the aisle. Let them pass you. Maybe you could get to the front and get away. But you guys, there's an outside chance they might not notice us. And I said, you're the son of one of the big three. Your smell might be overpowering. I can't just leave you.
Don't worry about us, Grover said. Go. My hands trembled. I felt like a coward, but I took the Yankees cap and put it on. When I looked down, my body wasn't there anymore. I started creeping up the aisle. I managed to get up in ten rows, then duck into an empty seat, just as the Furies walked past. Mrs. Dodd stopped, sniffing, and looked straight at me. My heart was pounding. Apparently, she didn't see anything. She and her sisters kept going. I was free. I made it to the front of the bus. We were almost through the Lincoln Tunnel now. I was about to press the emergency stop button when I heard hideous wailing from the back now. The old ladies were not old ladies anymore. Their faces were still the same. I guess they couldn't get any uglier, but their bodies had shriveled into leathery brown hag bodies with bat wings and hands and felt like gargoyle claws. Oh, hands and feet like gargoyle claws. Their handbags had turned into fiery whips. The Furies surrounded Grover and Annabeth, lashing their whips, hissing, Where is it? Where? The other people on the bus were screaming, cowering in their seats. They saw something, all right. He's not here, Annabeth yelled. He's gone. The Furies raised their whips. Annabeth drew a bronze knife. Grover grabbed a tin can from his snack bag and prepared to throw it. What I did next was so impulsive and dangerous that I should have been named ADHD poster child of the year. The bus driver was distracted, trying to see what was going on in the rearview mirror. Still invisible, I grabbed the wheel from him and jerked it to the left. Everybody howled as they were thrown to the right, and I heard what I hoped was the sound of three furies smashing against the windows. Hey! The driver yelled. Hey, whoa! He wrestled for the wheel. The bus slammed against the side of the tunnel, grinding metal, throwing sparks a mile behind us. We careened out of the Lincoln Tunnel and back into the rainstorm. People and monsters tossed around the bus. Cars plowed aside like bowling pins. Somehow the driver found an exit. We shot off the highway. Through a half a dozen traffic lights, I ended up barreling down one of those New Jersey rural roads. There, you can't believe there's so much nothing right across the river from New York. There were woods to our left, the Hudson River to our right, and the driver seemed to be veering toward the river. Another great idea, I hit the emergency brake. The bus wailed, spun a full circle on the wet asphalt, and crashed into the trees. The emergency lights came on. The door flew open. The bus driver was the first one out. The passengers yelling as they stamped after him, stampeded after him. I stepped into the driver's seat and let him them pass. The Furies regained their balance. They lashed their whips at Annabeth while she waved her knife and yelled in ancient Greek, telling them to back off. Grover threw tin cans. I looked at the open doorway. I was free to go, but I couldn't leave my friends. I took off the invisible cap. Hey! The Furies turned, burying their yellow fangs at me. The exact... The exit suddenly seemed like an excellent idea. Mrs. Dodds stalked up the aisle, just as she was used to do, used to do in class, about to deliver my F minus math test. Every time she flicked her whip, red flames danced along the barbed leather. Her two ugly sisters hopped onto the top of the seats and on either sides and crawled toward me like huge nasty lizards. Perseus Jackson. Mrs. Dodd said in an ancient, in an accent that was definitely from somewhere farther south in Georgia. You have offended the gods. You shall die. I liked you better as a math teacher, I told her. She growled. Annabeth and Grover moved up behind the Furies, cautiously looking for an opening. I took the ballpoint pen out of my pocket and uncapped it, ripped tied elongated into a shimmering double-edged sword. The Furies hesitated. Miss Dodds had felt ripped tied's blade before. She obviously didn't like seeing it again. Submit now. She hissed, and you will not suffer eternal torment. Nice try, I told her. Percy, look out, Annabeth cried. Mrs. Dodds lashed her whip around my sword hand while the Furies on the other side lunged at me. My hand felt like it was wrapped in molten lead, but I managed to not drop Riptide. I struck the Fury on the left with its hilt, sending her toppling back into a seat. I turned and sliced the fury on the right. As soon as the blade connected to her neck, she screamed and exploded into dust. Annabeth got Miss, Mrs. Dodds in the wrestler's hold and yanked her backward while Grover ripped the whip out of her hands. Ow, he yelled. Ow, hot, hot. The fury I hilt slammed came at me again, talons ready, but I swung rip tight and she broke open like a pinata. Mrs. Dodds was trying to get Annabeth off her back. She kicked, clawed, hissed, and bit. But Annabeth held on while Grover got Mrs. Dodds' leg tied up in it, her own whip. Finally, they both shoved her backward into the aisle. Mrs. Dodds tried to get up, but she didn't 
have room to flap her bat wings. She kept falling down. Zeus will destroy you, she promised. Hades will have your soul. Prakas meas vishimi, I yelled. I wasn't sure where the Latin came from. I think it meant eat my pants. Thunder shook the bus. The hair rose on the back of my neck. Get out, Annabeth yelled at me. Now. I didn't need any encouragement. We rushed outside and found another passengers wandering through around in the days, arguing with the driver or running around in circles yelling, we're gonna die. A Hawaiian shirt tourist with a camera snapped my photograph before I could recap my sword. Our bags, Grover realized. We left our, boom, the windows of the bus exploded as the passengers ran for cover lightning shredded the huge crater in the roof but an angry wail from the inside told me dodds was not yet dead run annabeth said she's calling for reinforcements we have to get out of here we plunged into woods into the woods and rain poured down in the bus as flames it was in flames behind us and nothing but darkness ahead that is the end of chapter 10. Next week, I will go into chapter 11. We visit the Garden Gnome Emporium. Thank you for joining me for Greek Mythology at the Enclave. Have a good one.